a wicked generation seeketh a sign. Okay, a wicked generation seeketh a sign. In fact, I'll read that verse. You don't need to turn there, but the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and they said, show us a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered and said, he told them, verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now with all of these uh, thought now would be a good time to tell, talk about what does the Bible say about the signs of our times. The signs of the end times, the signs that the rapture is near, or the second coming, or what are the signs in the Bible? And the, definitely there are signs that Christ has given. And it's only one. Matthew 16, 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it. So sorry, stop looking for signs. The only sign is, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Okay? So if you want a sign, you have one. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's your sign. That's your one sign. The topic is about the looking after a sign. And people will say, and I talk to people in my neighborhood even, and they'll say, hey, this is definitely a sign. We're entering into the tribulation, or we're about to enter into the tribulation, or Matthew chapter 4 talks about you know, wars and rumors of wars and pestilences, and this is a sign from God. All right? So be very careful about a couple of things. One, remember, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And the only sign given to us is the sign of the resurrection. So this is not a sign. And number two, be careful. Um, careful in, in trying to think that you know the answer to why things happen. All right? You can ask God why when you get to heaven. But until then, don't be like Job and think that you know why God does things. Okay, remember the book of Job is the lesson that says don't ask why. Job says this terrible things happened to me and I need to know why. And God says, no you don't. No you don't. Now God was kind and he did tell him why. He didn't have to you and he does not for you. Alright? So some people say, well the coronavirus is because uh you know, God needs to punish this world for sin, for idolatry, for adultery, for the church is, is abominable. And you don't know why, and neither do I. When we're in heaven, we can ask God why, and then we'll know. We can speculate and guess, but as far as why, we don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Let's not pretend we do, because we don't. In fact, we are not even allowed to ask why. All right? So don't say this is a sign. Don't say this is happening because you don't know because. You don't know why, neither do I. All right. So what does the Bible say about signs? Because we know there are some signs besides the resurrection. And who are they for and what are they about? Well, let's take a look, a close look. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 is the Olivet Discourse. All right. And uh, the most famous of these is it's the same... Uh, it's the same incident, just written three times in the three Gospels. And Mark, in Matthew chapter 24 is the most uh, most well known of these three. So we'll start there, Matthew chapter 24, verse one. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, buildings plural of the temple. So there's the temple and the buildings around it. And Jesus said unto them. See not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, now Jesus is, was brought that up because Luke 21 says that they, when he went to go see a poor widow casting in her two mites, it says that the people were talking about the temple and how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. So people were saying, whoa, look at the stones, look at how rich this temple and how beautiful and decadent it is and one of his disciples says master look at these stones now i believe personally that was judas just a guess because who else would be so amazed by the jewels and the gems and the physical riches that can be uh found there all right and jesus says hey guess what to his disciples he says you know that all of these stones will be taken apart and will be thrown, and not one stone will be left upon another. Alright? 
And we know that this would happen in 40 years' time. That was around 30 AD when Jesus said that, probably more like 27, 28, since he was born 2 BC. And this is just before he'd be crucified. Uh, and so the disciples are saying, look at this temple. And Jesus says, you know what? Every single, this temple is going to be taken apart and thrown down like garbage. All right. And as he said upon, verse 3, the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, now these would be four of his disciples. We see that from Mark 13. Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to Jesus and said, tell us when shall all these things be? All right, now what are the these things, okay? The these things are, of course, when will the destruction of the temple happen? Okay, the these things are the destruction of the temple, all right? In Mark, it says, tell us when shall these things be? And then Luke also, it says, tell us what, what sh when shall these things be? All right, so all three gospel accounts record that. But then the second part, or the second question, differs by, by each account. Um, in Matthew, it says, When shall these things be? Um, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, now, sounds like three questions, but really it's not. And I'll get to that in a minute. When shall these things be, the destruction of the temple? When will be your coming? See, they understood somewhat that Jesus was going to leave, and then he was going to come again and start his kingdom. And when will be the end of the world? And then Mark, it says, um, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? All right? So you can see by Mark's account, it's kind of all one question in their mind, because they don't know about the rapture, they don't know about the crucifixion, the ascension, the resurrection. They don't know about these things. They just know that at some point, Jesus will leave and come back at the second coming. They don't know anything about the rapture, okay? That would be revealed later to them. And so they say, And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Then the Luke account says, um, When shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Okay, so we can take together and say, that they believe this is all one event. Now, we know in hindsight, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, all right? 40 years after this was, this conversation took place, all right? And we know the rapture, the second coming, the abomination of desolation, these things have not happened, all right? But in the mind of the disciples at this time, James, John, Peter, and Andrew, they thought this was all one event. When the temple is destroyed, that means the end of the world, that means Christ returns. We know that these are not these are separate events, but in their mind it was one event. So it's kind of like, what's the sign of this going to happen when the temple is destroyed and the world ends and you come and return and set up your kingdom? When is this one event to them in their mind? When do these things happen? What is the sign? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. All right? Next verse is a little tricky. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right? What exactly does that mean? What exactly is Jesus saying? Who is the I am Christ? Who's the I there? All right? Now, there's two explanations. One is the more traditional, common explanation. Many shall come in my name, that would be Jesus, saying, I am Christ. So someone like a Kibaloi type, all right? He's going to come. He's going to say, I am the Christ. I Kibaloi am the Christ and shall deceive many. All right? The second uh, interpretation is, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. That means come in Jesus' name and say that Jesus is the Christ. Not that they are claiming to be the Christ himself, but that Jesus is the Christ and shall deceive many. All right? Mark says it like this. Um, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. Luke says, uh, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore after them. All right? So which one is it? Is it them saying that Jesus is the Christ and then they will deceive many? 
Bible believers, maybe not Christians, but Bible believers, like you see at uh, Joel Osteen, largest church in America, Joel Osteen, Houston, Texas. I've been there a few times just to see what a disaster it is, okay? And he says, I come in the name of Christ. Jesus is the Christ. I come in his name and he deceives many, okay? Or is it people like Kibaloi that says, I am the Christ, speaking of themselves. And I come in the name of Jesus, and I am Christ. Okay? Just reading the plain, simple language, it seems to appear that there will be people like Kibaloi, like the son of perdition, the man of sin, that some call the Antichrist, who will come and declare himself to be Christ. All right? The Messiah. To me, it sounds like just the wording, it's, it's, and you won't find any insight in the Greek either, that it's really talking about those that claim to be they are the Christ. All right? But at any rate, either way, there will be people that claim either they are the Christ or they come in the name of Jesus Christ and say, uh, the time draweth near. In other words, listen to me. Either I am Christ or I represent Jesus Christ. Listen to me and I can tell you right now there are signs and the time is near. Look at the coronavirus, look at the volcano, look at the floods, the earthquakes. The time is near, it's upon us. And Jesus says that, and shall deceive many. All right, and they'll say the time draweth near. And Jesus says, uh, go ye not, therefore, after them. Okay. Back to Matthew 24. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For these things shall come to pass. But the end is not yet. You see that? End is not yet. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. This is all going to happen. The end is not yet. All right? Uh, Mark says, And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. And Luke says, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. It's not immediately going to happen. Okay? Now again, there's two different takes on this. One is, well, there's three, but some are ridiculous. One is that... If, you, if there are wars and rumors of wars, that means the rapture is about to happen. Okay, that's take number one. So you see these people, mostly Pentecostals, but even a lot of Baptists, they'll go and they'll look at the newspaper and, oh, look at this. Oh, look what the newspaper says. That's a sign. That's a sign. The rapture is about to happen. There's a sign in the newspaper. Okay, they, look, they turn on their TV. Coronavirus. There's a volcano and an earthquake. That's a sign. That's a sign. The rapture's coming. Everyone panic. The rapture's coming. Are you watching? Are you watching? Look at these signs. Okay? There's no sign for the rapture. The only sign we got was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is not tied to the rapture. The disciples are not asking about the rapture. They don't know about the harpazo, which is rapture. They don't know anything about that. It's not even been revealed yet to them. They're not asking about that. They're asking about the return of Jesus Christ bodily, physically, for all the world to see, for the purpose of establishing his kingdom. None of that happens at the rapture, okay? He says, for nation. So when does this happen? Okay, it is my view that this happens after the rapture during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. All right, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, we know that there's wars, rumors of wars, there's a signing of the seven-year peace treaty from the man of sin, or the, also known as the son of perdition. And it says these things must come to pass, but that doesn't mean that Christ is about to come, as in second coming. There's a lot of prophecy that needs to be fulfilled during the tribulation before the second coming. There is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled from now until the rapture. In fact, after Pentecost, there was no prophecy that needed to be fulfilled from the time after Pentecost until the rapture. It's called the imminency of the return, okay? Or the imminency of the rapture, or the harpazo in Greek. Some people say, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Okay, fine, call it harpazo. You know what harpazo means? It means rapture. So, take that for what you will. All right. 
there's no signs of the rapture. When there's wars, when there's rumors of wars, when there's people claiming to be Christ, or there's people who are, uh, say they come in the name of Jesus who is Christ, and that the time draweth near, Jesus says, don't follow them. Okay? There's no sign for the rapture. And there's a lot of prophecy from when the tribulation begins to when the second coming happens. There's a lot that will need to happen. It's not about to happen yet. All right? So at the beginning of the tri rap at the beginning of the tribulation after the rapture, people will be saying the, the the emergence of Christ is about to happen. And Jesus says, "No, the emergence of the fake Christ, antichrist, son of perdition, the man of sin, that's what's about to happen." There's a lot of prophecy before the real Christ will happen. So what Christ is doing is he's trying to teach the people in the generation that will be alive, especially the Jews and the alive in the generation during the tribulation saying, don't fall for the Antichrist. Don't fall for it. Okay? Uh, verse number 7. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences like coronavirus and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And we look at the vial and the trumpet, bold judgments during the book of Revelation, the angel pours them out we can see that their judgments begin before three and a half years. Some people call it the free wrath. As if the first three and a half years of the tribulation are wonderful. They're not. During the first three and a half years, you see the beginning already of sorrows. You see pestilences, earthquakes, and diverse places and famines. Okay? It gets a whole lot worse. It's the beginning of sorrows or the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. Okay? So, the earthquakes are signs, the pestilences are signs, and the uh, nation rising against nation and wars. Those are signs of what? That you're in the tribulation, which happens after the rapture. They are not signs for the rapture. If you're looking for a sign, that means you, lift, you missed the rapture. If you're looking for a sign of the rapture, open the Bible. There's no sign for the rapture. I'm sorry, but there's not. Verse 9. So here we have the beginning of sorrows, and what happens after the beginning of sorrows? Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. Who's the you? It's the Jews alive during the tribulation. So they were not believing, not believers during the rapture. They believed after the rapture. Either they're part of the 144,000, or they were saved under the preaching of the 144,000. And the Antichrist is coming onto the scene, the son of perdition, the man of sin. He's about to proclaim himself to be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in the holy place. And Jesus is saying, don't be fooled. Because first, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. They will hate one another. I'm going to read it real quick. Uh, the revelation, what, what happens during this time. Okay, Revelation 13, 5 through 7. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. That's the Antichrist. The Bible calls the son of perdition or the man of sin. Never calls him the Antichrist. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years. The world does not last forty-two more months. Three and a half years. Okay, it doesn't. Because it was shortened. Otherwise, everyone would be dead if it went the full three and a half years. But power was given unto him to last that amount of time. But it, which it does it. Okay? It does it. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy. This is the son of perdition. Against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That's what it's talking about when it says the beginning of sorrows. And then, after the beginning of sorrows, after the first three and a half years, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, will sit in the holy place, declare himself to be the Messiah, and then it will be given power to him to make war with the saints and to win and to overcome. Okay, that's called the abomination of desolation. Okay? Verse 9. We'll get to that in a second, hopefully, if I have time. 
Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Okay, verse 10. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise, and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, of the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure till the end, the same shall be saved. Some people say that's works salvation. Obviously it's not. It's talking about saved from what? Saved from hell? No. Nope. Saved from sin? No. It's saved from physical death. He that shall endure unto the end. What's that? The end of his life? No. Not talking about doing good works for salvation to the end of your life. Talking about enduring physically your life to the end of the tribulation. The end of the almost seven years tribulation. Specifically here, the last almost three and a half years or almost 42 months. Okay? Not talking about salvation by works. It's talking about physical death, physical salvation to live in the kingdom if you make it alive to the end. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I hate to be the dead horse, but some people say that the gospel needs to reach the farther areas of the entire world, the deepest jungles of Africa, and the far-flung uh, islands of the Pacific. And when the very last place has been reached with the gospel, then the rapture will take place, and that's the end. We are not talking about the rapture. We're talking about the second coming. Again, Peter, James, John, and Andrew don't even know what the harpazo is. They don't even really know much about this. Uh, the, they don't really know anything about the crucifixion. So again, the end here that shall come in verse 14 is not the rapture. Okay? It's not the church's job to bring the gospel to the whole world and then we will usher in the rapture. No. Okay, the rapture will happen whether the church brings the gospel to the farthest areas of the world or not. Should we? Yes, we should. Will we? I don't know. Have we yet? I don't think so. All right? But during the, during the tribulation, the gospel will go forth all the way to the end of the world. Who will bring it? The 144,000 called the elect. Those that were saved under the ministry of those 144,000 Jews. Also, the two witnesses... We don't know their names. I believe, personally, one is John the Apostle. Okay? I don't know who the other one is. I really don't care, to be honest. And maybe I'm wrong about John the Apostle being one of those two witnesses. Don't know, really don't care. All right? But the gospel will go forth to the end of the world during the tribulation, and then will come the end. That end is not the rapture. That end is the second coming. Verse 15. When you, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation... That's talking about in the book of Daniel, all right? Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, now there will come a time, if you read the book of Daniel, in three different places, it talks about the abomination of desolation. It's where uh, Antiochus Epiphanes did it first, and then later the Antichrist, or the son of perdition, the man of sin will do it. Three and a half years into the tribulation begins the great tribulation, and that's when he proclaims himself to be the Messiah, and then he declares war. You see, he will lead a European delegation into Israel, and he'll pretend it's for their peace and safety. Okay, like the politicians. Stay home, don't go to church, because we're concerned about your safety. Okay, the governor of Illinois in the United States said, we will not allow church to reopen until a vaccine is made, which could, in theory, never happen. You think he cares about their safety? No, he wants to shut down all churches permanently. No surprise, he's a politician. All right? So, the son of perdition will lead a, Euroge uh, a European delegation into Israel under the false premise of peacekeeping, and then they will say, actually, that's a joke. We're not here to, for peace, we're here for a war. And the son of perdition will declare himself to be the Messiah, standing in the holy place. All right? When that happens, if you're a Jew, you need to run. Okay? If you're in, if you're in Jerusalem, especially, but if you're in anywhere in Israel, you need to run for your life. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judah 
flee into the mountains. When is this? This is halfway through the tribulation. It's during the abomination of desolations. It's when the man of sin proclaims himself to be the Messiah. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. All right? If you're there working on your roof or you're in the third floor, get out. Get out. War is breaking out. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. If you're a farmer and you hear about the desolation of abom abomination of desolations, run. Don't go home and get your clothes. Run. Flee. Neither let him which is... Uh, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. If you're breastfeeding, you're a new mom. It's going to be hard making that dangerous trip trying to flee to the mountains. Of, it says, uh, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be, that's after the three and a half years, great tribulation, such as what's not since the beginning of the world to this time, no ever, nor ever shall be. Some people think this would happen in 70 AD when the Romans came. They said that was the abomination of desolation. Or later, when Antioch, or before that, Antiochus Epiphanes. No, it wasn't. It says there will be nothing like this nor ever anything again will happen. All right? And except those days should be shortened. Remember I told you it's not quite three and a half years or 42 months. Except those days should be shortened. No flesh. Uh, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists. Those days shall be shortened. Okay? Because they were the ones that are given the kingdom. All right, and if they die, there's no one to give the kingdom to. All right. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Okay, so here comes uh, the son of perdition, proclaims himself to be Christ, and if anyone says, there's the Christ, Jesus says, no, at that time, I have not returned. Okay, there is no Christ on earth at that time. Don't believe anybody that says that. That's not true. Verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs, like the son of perdition, and false prophets, like the beast, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Okay, now those elect, uh, comes from uh, Revelation chapter 7, it's the 144,000. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So at the time of the tribulation, at the beginning of the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, people will proclaim themselves to be the Messiah. And here Jesus is saying, don't believe that. At the time of the abomination of desolation, don't believe them. I've not come yet. There's still more prophecy to be fulfilled before I come. Don't be deceived. Wherefore, if they shall, uh, verse 27, for as the, how will Christ come? Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When you look up in the sky and you see lightning, and it goes, right? You'll see Christ up in the sky like you would a brilliant, bright, flashing lightning. Okay? Obviously, this is not the tribulation, or the rapture, because that, they won't see it. It'll be in the blink of an eye. All right? So this is not the rapture. This is the second coming. The whole world will see this. Whereas the rapture, none of the world will see it. Only believers. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles or vultures be gathered together. It'll be a period of great death when Christ comes. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. So after the abomination of desolations, after that, during the next three and a half years, what's going to happen? The moon shall not give her light. The sun shall be darkened. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Some people say, well, this is blood moon. We can see a blood moon. It's the sign of the rapture. No, it's not. It's the sign of the second coming after the abomination of desolation during the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. Okay, all the world's going to see this, and they're going to mourn. Whereas the rapture, 
when the believers see it, we're not going to mourn. We will rejoice. And the unbelievers won't see it at all. So it will not be a time of death and mourning, but of celebration. Verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds that's on the earth, from one end of the heaven to the other. This is not the rapture. Christ comes to gather his saints at the rapture. Here it's the angels that come to gather. Okay, this is the second coming. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. When you see these things happening, you know the second coming is at the door. It's happening. You look up. And then, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day, what's the day? Some are going to say the rapture. Most will say the rapture. But when did we get to the rapture? All of this time, from the time of Peter, James, John, and Andrew's question, has the rapture come up at all? Nope. Are any of these signs, signs of the rapture? What are all of these signs of? The second coming, okay? Now, this is a confusing chapter, all right? And in my life, I've gone back and forth. There's a couple of these verses I even told you I'm not sure. It's not very important. I'm just not sure about, you know, false Christ or come in the name of Jesus Christ. Some things I'm not sure about, okay? This, I don't want to lose any friends here. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. I'm just saying, it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, it's not that important, and maybe I'm wrong. I might change my mind in the future. I've changed my mind in the past. And it's hard for me to come to this conclusion, but just based on what I've read so far, when it says, verse 36, but of the day and hour knoweth no man, it's talking about the second coming and not the rapture. Just based on what I can see. And I looked at Mark 13 and Luke 21. It says, but of the day and the hour no man knoweth. Knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven but my Father only. Now today Jesus knows, okay? But at this time, he set apart some attributes of himself. Some of those attributes of himself were the, the, the fulfillment of the end times of when he would come back, okay? So today, yes, Christ knows when he will return. At the time he said this, he did not. He set that aside. As he did a lot of others, of his attributes, he set them aside. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, giving in marriage, doing things that you do normally and naturally, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So what happened? Noah goes into the ark, and what happens to Noah? He's gone. What happens to the people left behind? They're judged. And knew it not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Which coming? Rapture or second coming? So far in this chapter, and from the a mind of the questioners, which are the four of the apostles, they don't know anything they're not asking about. They have never intended to ask about anything about the rapture. I don't know why we would go through all of this time talking about the second coming and then switch gears and now suddenly start talking about the rapture. I know from preaching and from great sermons and probably I've preached this, I don't know. We always talk about this as being the rapture and from what I'm saying, as of now, as I sit here before you this day, I don't see it as being the rapture. I see it as being the second coming of the Son of Man, the day of Christ, not the first. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Sounds like the rapture, but... Who's doing the taking? Well, it's the angels. It's not Christ. In the rapture, who does the taking? Christ. Here, who's doing the taking? It's the angels. All right? The one that's being taken is one of the elect, the, the people in the 144,000, those that will be transferred to Jerusalem to reign with Christ in the millennial reign. Now, remember, God promised to Abraham land that he has not fulfilled yet. He will fulfill that promise in the millennium. So who will be taken? Disappear. Two men are in a field, two women at the well. One will disappear. Who is that one? It's one of the Jews, the elect, the one of the saved Jews that will inherit the area of 
of uh, Israel promised to Abraham. To this day, they have not received fulfillment of that promise. But they will on this day. So this is not talking about the rapture. If you're one of those two men in that field, you want to be the one taken, not the one left. Okay, just like in the flood, it wasn't instant like the rapture. The flood came, the rains came down, and it, you know, maybe a day or two or whatever, the people were alive to realize we should have been on this ark. Okay, it's not instant. Neither was the rapture. So this is talking to me, I believe, this is talking about the second coming and not about the rapture. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay? So, what is my point in all of this? Many points. Take things in context. Be careful with how you use scripture. Mainly, don't look for a sign. A lot of people running crazy right now. A lot of people running wild, mostly Pentecostals, saying, this is the sign. The rapture is coming. Or some people say, oh, there's no rapture. We're entering into the tribulation. There's no sign for the rapture, folks. All right? There's no sign for the rapture. If you want to, if you want to be looking for a sign, you'll find that sign in the resurrection of Jesus Christ.